Before I get into tonight's lesson, which I want to jump into quickly because we got a bunch of stuff, good stuff to cover, um, I wanted to quickly review what we covered last time and what we didn't get a chance to cover. So did everybody get a chance to watch those short videos on the arguments? Yeah? Okay, so they're pretty efficient little videos that I think do a good job of setting up those arguments. So last week what we spent a long time on was the Kalam cosmological argument. And if I'm going to boil that down in a one sentence, it's that the universe had a beginning and therefore had a cause, and that cause appears to have all the attributes of what we know as the biblical God, right? So the universe began and God created it. That's the one. The second one is the fine-tuning argument. Uh, arguably, the fine-tuning argument's been around for a long time. Uh, you've probably heard of it as intelligent design. In fact, what we're going to talk about tonight with respect to evolution feeds right into that fine-tuning or intelligent design argument. But what I'll call as a subset of intelligent design, the fine-tuning argument, is recent, recent as in the last several hundred years, discoveries of constants of the universe, right? So we're learning more about the cosmos, uh, and we're coming up with more laws of nature and how the cosmos acts. So one of those laws of nature that you're all familiar with, even if you don't know that you're familiar with it, is the law of gravity, right? The calculation of the force of gravity that you feel between two massive objects, that has a constant in it, just a number, an arbitrary unitless number. It's like a multiplier. It, you know, it could be one half, it could be two, it could be anything. There's 26 of these constants now in various different equations and how the universe works. And it turns out that if you were to change any one of them by an almost incomprehensible amount, the universe would collapse on itself or have never been formed in the first place. Um, so the, the unique part about that argument is that as far as we can tell today, all of those constants are completely independent of each other. By that I mean if you were to turn up or down the gravitational constant, what determines the force of gravity, it would have zero impact on any of the other constants. They're totally independent. Yet they are all extraordinarily fine-tuned. By extraordinarily fine-tuned, I mean some of them you can't change well beyond one in the number of protons and neutrons in the known universe, right? With an estimate of about 10 to the 80th protons and neutrons in all the known universe, and some of those constants, if you change them by one part in 10 to like the 250th. So if you were to turn a dial and slice it into 10 with 250 zeros after the end, if you turn it one notch, the universe would collapse. So the, the argument against that is, well, just because it's really low probability doesn't mean it's zero probability. You know, everybody wins the Powerball, right? When you go play the Powerball, you say, well, it was only a one in a million or billion chance I was going to win the Powerball, but somebody was going to win the Powerball, right? Like there's always, you got that one chance. Well, the, the misunderstanding there is one, the odds associated with each individual constant and the fact that there's 26 independent constants. So the odds of a chain of independent things, it's as if you won the Powerball every single day of your life from now to the time you're 100 years old and at the end of that, you said, yeah, it was all random chance. Uh, I just won the Powerball every day because there's always a chance I could win the Powerball, and I happened to win it you know, 15,000 times in a row. Um, those are the types of number facts. The numbers are even way worse than that. So there's a lot of, if you looked at the notes from last week, there's a lot of contemporary physicists that find it hard to deny that the universe looks like it's been designed to exist. Okay, so first argument, universe is created. We can, we can induce a conclusion that the cause of its creation sounds a lot like God. Then we find evidence in the mathematics that constructs the universe, that it looks like it was designed. And then the third argument, it's a tricky argument to understand, but if, if you grasp it, this free thinking argument, I find it very convincing myself. And what you'll find in a lot of um, modern atheists, in fact, the most famous of the modern atheists, the four horsemen, they're all pure naturalists. And by naturalist, it means all that exists, when they say the word nature, all that exists is matter 
and physics and chemistry, right? There, there is nothing supernatural. All that exists can be described with mathematical equations and the interactions of physics and chemistry, right? Well, if you reduce the interactions in your brain down to just chemical interactions, because inside your brain are neurons, they fire electrical signals with chemicals, that's why you drink Gatorade with ions, right? If it was just complete chemical reactions over which you have no control over that produce thoughts in your brain, then you effectively can't make any free choice, right? You have no ability to look at two potential truth claims and based on evidence, decide which truth claim was more reasonable to believe. So if you can't make that assessment, if you don't have the free will to choose between two different truth claims and which one is more true based on the evidence, then you have no claim to the fact that the beliefs you hold are true or not. You just hold those beliefs because of chemical reactions in your brain and you are predetermined to hold those beliefs. There are literally people who hold this view now and say that all the knowledge they hold is illusory knowledge. It just seems like knowledge because there is no such thing as a soul. Your brain has no supernatural attributes to it, right? So if you hold that belief, you can't even actually make a reasonable argument that you hold that belief because you don't believe you can make free choice when it comes to uh, reasoned decisions, right? That's a little hard one. You, you have to read through that one a few times. If, if um, there are longer videos than the one I sent you, they're actually podcasts where they really work through that one. But that's a really interesting one too, right? So with our three arguments from last week, we have the universe was created by a cause that has a lot of the attributes of what we understand about God. We have that not only was the universe created, that it seems pretty undeniably to be designed. And three, that the, the human mind, the personal experience, inarguably has a supernatural aspect to it. Um, your mind, which when I say the word mind, we can think of the, the word soul, right? The supernatural aspect of your personhood uh, has to exist for you to claim that any knowledge or reason exists whatsoever, okay? So those are our quick review, and we can go over those in more detail after class if you have questions. So everybody good with that? Did everybody get to read or watch Stephen Meyer's video? All right, so we're going to spend hopefully the whole last hour of the class on that. Uh, yeah, the whole last hour of the class on that. So before we get into that, I want to touch a little bit just on science in general. So uh, I think the official title of this class is Science and Christianity. Um, so s there are some real fundamental questions um, about existence that science is just unable to, to even participate in the discussion of. And we'll cover that in a bit with... Um, definitions of what science is. What it has become for most people, though, is a way to shut out and ignore, um, in my view, this is my opinion, so I'm preaching to the choir, so it's probably a safe opinion in this room. Uh, it's a way for them to shut out and ignore examining those questions deeply um, for reasons that are probably personal to each person. So it has become their new religion, right? So we're going to cover evolution tonight. Um, but if you think in a lot of ways, you know, the, the three major figures of the 20th century that are pretty foundational to the way um, postmodernist thinking exists now. So you have Karl Marx, uh, the founder of communism, right? He established a way to have a future utopia outside of God. You have Darwinism, which is what we're going to cover tonight, which gives you a way to establish a creation story without God, right? And then you have Freud, who gave you a way to deal with your guilt outside of God. And if you, if you think of like the three ways in which a lot of people who don't culturally look at the world the way we do as Christians, it's a, they might not even understand, but it's through those three people and their foundational ideas that, that they're replacing God in their life, right? Um, so I got a list of, of adjectives here. And uh, 
the title at the top of each column, you're, this is basically what you're going to get in modern society today when you hear those two words. Society has really boiled down everything into two camps, right? It's either science or it's religion. They put a bunch of stuff in that science camp that, that as a person who studied science, is arguably not science at all, right? And they've also set up a false barrier between the two that they're antithetical, that you can't be religious and be interested in science. Well, we're going to cover a little bit tonight on why that's just... It's absolutely absurd, right? So the first thing that you would be surprised is a very controversial topic of discussion. It's just what is science? Wouldn't seem like that hard of a question, right? But there's a lot of argument about this question uh, there isn't really a standard, widely accepted definition of science, not science, right? Um, so I'll give you my best definition, and uh, it's pretty, pretty basic. I think it fits, right? So we covered the first one last week. It's methods for determining cause and effect relationships. So that whole inductive reasoning, law of causality, we covered last week, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. That is really the pursuit of science. It's observing an effect, trying to understand its, its cause then looking at that cause as an effect and trying to understand its cause, right? So to put this simpler, I like to think of it as the observation of the how. How stuff works. And we're going to cover this in depth next. But all science really ever says is things tend to act this way. I've observed this a bunch of times, and they tend to act this way. In fact, I can describe how they tend to act in a general form. When I do this, this tends to happen. And the more examples we have of that relationship, the stronger our theory gets. And the reason you always hear everything called a theory is because it's only ever a theory. It's hard to prove anything positive. It's way easier in science. In fact, what they call it, it's like you can do, it takes one negative example to disprove a theory. You can have, you know, all the way up to infinite examples to prove a theory. That's why it's always a theory. So it goes from a hypothesis to a theory. A theory means... You know, we've got a lot of data built up that this is a pretty good relationship of how things tend to act. Um, but things change, right? So everybody's heard of Isaac Newton. We would want to have called Isaac Newton's laws of motion fact for a very long time. And now we know that they're actually all erroneous. They're completely full of errors. They're very good at approximating the true laws here on Earth, but Einstein showed that they, they don't actually work on a larger or smaller scale, right? And we'll talk about that later. So this is good, right? So the, the, the thing that all of science boils down to is the description of uniform and repeated experience. And this is important because we're going to come back to that sentence. So. Everybody's got this. I'm going to erase it and, and basically sum it up. This is a description of uniform and repeated experience.
experience. So we're going to come back to this at the very end of the class. But you will find most people who say that their ground truth, my fundamental presupposition, remember last week we talked about the foundation of your house as your presuppositions? You can actually do tests to figure out which is the bottom brick in your foundation. You can have lots of presuppositions, but until your presuppositions come up against each other and are chal they, they challenge each other, you then have to pick which one is most foundational. And a lot of people who will claim that, that this is their most foundational presupposition will throw this away in order to keep the foundational presupposition that God does not exist. So we'll come back to that at the end of the class, right? So description of uniform and repeated experience. All right. So, so I, this is a funny quote. I touched on it last week at the very end. I just want to touch on it again because as we get better at, at learning about these topics, uh, you'll get better at sussing through people's, um, what, what worldview they're bringing to the table, right? So always remember, science, observations by themselves don't make claims. Only the people who are making the observations draw conclusions and make claims, right? So Frank Turek's awesome quote is that science doesn't claim anything, only scientists do, and all scientists bring their presuppositions and worldviews with them to the table when they interpret data, right? Um, so if you've never heard the, the funny saying nowadays that everybody can find statistics to make their argument, right? It's, it's along those same lines, right? Um, you can misconstrue or misconclude or you bring a lot of what you want to be true with you uh, when you're making conclusions. We all do it too in our own lives. I'm not trying to cast shade on just non-Christians. I mean, we all do it too. It's, it's, you have bias for what you want to happen, right? Um, so just remember, it doesn't matter if someone's an expert and has a PhD, like Mike. If you think he's wrong about the Bible, you can still call him out about being wrong about the Bible, right? So it's the same thing with scientists, right? So, so um, just remember that. So, all right. So what are the limitations of science? I'm going to move actually over to here because I want these to stay up for a little bit. So I like to think about science as like the hows, right? How does this happen? How does this happen? Like, what happens when this happens? This is how stuff works, right? What is science not capable of answering? The whys, okay? Science, science has no place amongst the whys. So, why? Why is the universe orderly? Why? Uh, does everybody know the double dashes? Just I'm bringing these words down, so not to write them again. Okay. Why is the universe predictable? Why is it describable by math? Right? What I pose to you tonight, and that a lot of other people have posed in the past, so not, again, nothing I say up here is original, it's all stolen, uh, is that science is built just as much on faith as any world religion. Faith in these three principles. In addition to the law of causality that we covered last week. That things don't just pop into existence for no reason. Right? There's, there's no scientific, for lack of a better word, <laughs> reason 
to assume that the world had to be orderly, the universe had to be orderly and predictable and not random. Why are the laws of physics what they are today and not totally different an hour from now? Why, when a scientist is making an experiment in his lab and leaves to go get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom and comes back, it's not totally exploded or disappeared and in another dimension or like completely dissolved into nothingness, right? The, the world, the, by, by the world, I mean the universe is very surprisingly reasonable. So if I take what we learned from last time, that the world was created and appears to be designed, it appears to be designed to be understandable by a rational being. This totally makes sense from our worldview, right? So we were made in the image of God. We think that there's evidence that God is an unembodied mind, right? He is the source of all reason and intelligence and has imbued us with some of his ability to reason and intellect. So when we're made in his image, well, he's unembodied, so part of his image is our minds, right? And it makes sense in our worldview that he would have constructed a universe that we would be able to comprehend and understand and learn about, right? But without that, it seems much more likely than not that the universe would be random and unpredictable. So normally when things happen by accident or randomly in your life, they're not very orderly or predictable or describable by math. If you take a bunch of Lego bricks and throw them up in the air, very rarely do they land in the shape of a castle, right? So if you think of all the possibilities for which, with which the universe could be constructed, there's, there's an intuition of design just in the fact that it's constructed so exquisitely and reasonably, right? Um, these are the types of questions that you're not allowed to ask if you're in the secular science community. So asking why are the laws of physics the way they are can literally get you fired from your university position if you don't have tenure, right? Um, the, the quote I have down here is, is you know, don't worry, about, don't worry about these questions. They're a waste of time and even foolish to consider. Right? You can spend your entire adult life examining one particular mathematical equation about a law of the universe, but to step back and say, why is the universe even describable by mathematics is a fool's errand. They're questions that that community is not allowed to even consider. So remember that they're taking a bunch of stuff purely on faith, that they can walk away from something and come back and that it's going to be the same as it was before. That Random things don't just occur, that the universe is predictable and stable and, and understandable, right? The um, other thing that physicists and scientists are not allowed to ask is a topic that we touched on a little bit last week, which are the two types of causes, right? So, I'm going to write an equation that nobody knows on the board, probably. Oh, x is equal to x naught, you don't have to write this down, plus vt minus one half at squared, okay? That's the equation of motion that describes the path your baseball takes when you throw it. That nice parabolic arc that everybody knows with you shooting a rifle or throwing a football, right? This is, this is how you can describe it. <laughs> but no one would know what you were talking about. There. Correct. So, my question is, is this what causes the football to act that way? Does this math equation have causal power? If I slip in a different variable like that and then go throw a football, is it going to act different? No, right? So, we learned last week that mathematics, abstract objects, they don't have causal power. They're, they're a descriptor, right? And I would argue that they're a discovery of mankind, not an invention of mankind. We could have picked 
different arbitrary marks on paper to represent numbers and letters. But you still would have been able to find this relationship between whatever different arbitrary scratches on the board you want to make that describe the way a football goes, right? So again, things you're not allowed to ask in science is, well, why does the football always follow that equation instead of a different one, right? Where's the causal power of gravity? We can describe how gravity pulls on things, but why, right? And that goes back to those two types of causes. We have physical causes and we have agent causes, right? So the agent, the thing that's picking up the pen is me, right? Well, when we go all the way down the physical causes, so last week I was doing the whole chain of events of the physical causes, right? The atoms in my finger, blah, blah, blah. If I follow that chain of physics all the way down, eventually all you get to is about five equations. And from there, if you ask, well, what's, what's the actual causal relationship? You can't go any lower, right? You run out of physical causes. You just say, I don't know. Stuff tends to act like this. And that's the basis of science. You get to the bottom of science, and you literally throw up your hands, and you say, stuff just tends to act like this equation. And I don't know why it does, right? And that's where last week, where we referred to a few times this idea of the, the uh, unmoved mover or the sustainer or the necessary being. These are foundational to the argument for the existence of God that's outside of the Kalam cosmological argument that we learned, right? So we learned last week that the universe had a beginning and therefore it had to have a cause and that cause looks like God. Well, before that argument, before the Big Bang existed, like I said, there's people making that argument. There's also people making, there's a need for an agent or for something that forces things in this universe to act the way they do, right? What is the unmoved mover behind these equations? Because the equations themselves have no causal power to make things react like this. So I know this is like, we're deep, right? But this is as deep as it gets, folks, right? You don't even need to go to your physics class anymore because you already know the end. The end is, I don't know, stuff, stuff tends to act like this, and I don't know why, right? Again, questions not allowed to ask in the secular science community. There's a rich, an incredibly rich population of religious and Christian scientists and professors. Well, why, um... <coughs> No, that's all right. Why do you have an explanation of why there is a strong tolerance of people who uh, say science has to be opposed to religion? Why did that come about at all? I, it's changing now in certain circles. I'm not very solid on the history. From what I know, it's an artifact of history of um, people looking to science and religion as places to attain power. So we're all somewhat familiar with the Catholic Church's history throughout the empires of England, right? And so being a member of the Orthodox Church in the old empires was a great tower of power. Uh, well, that was that's also a song, yeah. Um, and uh, I think they were afraid to lose it and be challenged. The same way that now, for some of the stuff we're going to learn later tonight, that science itself is leading right back to the Bible, people are getting challenged and nervous and fighting tooth and nail against that be because They've gained power through science. The shift has happened to where now, um, you know, your classroom, politics, everything, science is the new church of the state, right? Whereas in England and in Europe, hundreds of years ago, you know, the pope and the bishops were the, the religion of power of the state, right? Um, so there's a history there where what I which is great, this is perfect. 
right into the next topic, which is we don't have to be afraid of science. So I, I think that's the answer. Without more detail, the answer is fear, right? Uh, fear that you're going to lose your influence. F fear that for some reason the Bible is not true, right? Like, you can be completely affirm that the Bible is true and that science is never going to ruin the Bible, right? But I think when people accumulated power underneath e either column, they're very afraid of losing that power, so they don't even want to give the chance, right? Uh, so we don't have to be afraid of science. Uh, Can I add part to the answer? Yeah, absolutely. Although I really like your answer. I'm not taking away, I'm adding. Um, I think the Enlightenment allows for the pride of man. So you had the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Enlightenment kind of all at the same time. And the Enlightenment says, okay, this is the age of reason. You people, look how the church has tried to hold back your reason and telling you dogma. And now we're free of that. And the church was for stupid people who couldn't understand how things work. So they'd say, well, God did it. But now we can actually understand how things work. And so they took it over and said, this is how we're going to explain everything. But then they did go too far. They went into philosophy, to the philosophy of, of being, of what is there and what isn't there, as uh, you outlined so well. Anyway, I threw myself a parabolic art there. And, and as he's writing on there, have any of you seen this book called The Disappearing Spoon? I, I'll, let me recommend it to you. It's fascinating. It's, it's a... It's a book on the history of the periodic table, which may sound like the most boring book in the world, but it isn't. And parts of it are a little, you're like, okay, I'm skimming because I really don't care about that much detail. But it's, it's very interesting. And one of the striking, first, you, just, just to hear them describe what elements are and just the sizes of atoms and in, compared to, do you know how everything is just space? You know, like your atoms are just space, but that's not the point I was getting at. The thing that blows me away in this is the pride of the scientist drives it. That these are the most petty political people that are, and in one way it's good. Competition between humans causes them to work harder, but they all want recognition. They all want their name on it. They all want the money. They all want the prize. They lie about each other. And so if you get this image that science, they're all, hmm, we all agree. It's not like that at all. They hate each other. They're petty people, just like any other people in any other business. You get a few nice ones, and most people are just, I'll stab you in the back if I get ahead, because that's what humans are like. It's not this monolith of holy priests uh, in, in, in lab coats at all. So I recommend that book, The Disappearing Spoon, which is because scientists have geeky jokes, right? And when the, the spoon is a, made out of a metal that melts at like 85 degrees. So they would say, here, use this spoon. And he puts it in his coffee and it dissolves. Ha, 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 ha. You know, this is lab coat humor. It's worse than pastor humor. <laughs> it's also a great way to poison your lab mates to death. <laughs> uh, accidentally. So uh, all I really want to say is, because, again, the class is, was originally intended to focus more towards the people getting ready to go to college. If, if any of the stuff we're going to cover today interests you, like, never be afraid that going into um, an engineering profession or a biology profession or a science profession it, is going to be problematic with you and your faith. Um, God made both types of revelation, and so taken properly in both, they go completely hand in hand, right? And if you understand this hows and whys, the science can talk about the hows, it has absolutely no claim on the, on the whys. It, it does not matter what happens over the next 1,000 years. Like, nothing in science is going to be able to answer the philosophical questions about the universe, which is really what God addresses. Why am I here? What's the purpose, right? Um, there's nothing in atoms or math equations that are going to answer those two questions. So they're completely safe. Uh, so uh, I got a great quote from 
Another guy from the 1100s, so this is not Al Ghazali. Uh, this is a guy by the name of Maimonides. Um, and he was a big proponent of not shying away from general revelation, which would be nature. He said, one ought to contemplate God's works and to marvel at the order and wisdom that went into their creation. When one does this, one inevitably comes to love God and to sense how insignificant one is in comparison to God, right? So if you're into that stuff, um, by all means, pursue a career in that. Uh, understood correctly, it will actually do nothing but, again, increase your awe for God. Um, so with that, let's get in the fun stuff. All right, so last week I got some good feedback that the E equals MC squared thing kind of... Uh, was interesting. We're going to do some more Einstein. All right. So, before, before I get into evolution, I cannot step into this minefield without covering some Einstein. Because we're going to walk into some dogmatic issues, and I'm going to try to avoid all of them. That's not the point of the class. Um, so, everybody, has everybody heard of Einstein? Has everybody heard of the theory of general relativity? Yes. Okay. 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 So, with the theory of general rel relativity... Uh, actually teaches us, or what was discovered, is that time and gravity are properties of space. So you have properties, right? Space has properties of which include time and gravity. So, what Einstein discovered was that an object that has mass, like you, bends space. And the easiest way to conceive of this in a three dimension, because this is in a higher order dimension, but if you imagine space as a very taut rubber sheet, if we were all to line up around the edge of this room, pull a rubber sheet very, very taut together, and throw a bunch of different sized balls on it, a bowling ball, a basketball, a ping pong ball, they would all make different sized dimples in the rubber sheet. And we can imagine as two of those balls were to come together, they would want to pull towards each other as one fell into the dimple of the bigger one. That is the force of gravity. So gravity's force is a function of the curvature of space produced by a mass. So again, don't make it more complicated than it has to be. Imagine space like a big rubber sheet. You put a big object in it like the sun, and smaller objects around it like our planets, they want to try to fall down into the dimple in the rubber sheet that the sun made. The bigger the sun is, the bigger that dimple and the steeper the walls of its dimple is, which means the harder they want to try to roll to the middle. Now everything's dynamic, so if you've ever gone to the mall and put a penny in one of those big blue things, that's why they do orbits, right? So they're trying to fall towards the center, but they've got other forces going around that make them hula hoop, basically, right? But that's gravity. So that big blue thing at the mall that you flip pennies into is a good visual for how mass bends space and produces gravity, okay? So gravity as a property of space is kind of like a measure of the curvature of that space. The more that space is bent, the steeper that dimple gets, the harder things want to try to fall towards the object that made the dimple. We all got that? Here comes the hard part. That was a fun part, right? Okay. Time is also a property of space associated with its curvature. So when mass curves space and produces gravity, it also changes the way objects 
in that space, in that curved space, experience the flow of time. This is hard. However, has anybody ever seen the movie Interstellar before? Okay. Crazy, but scientifically accurate. If, if you imagine gravity, it's not like an electromagnetic field. We just described it. But if you imagine it like an electromagnetic field, so like a radio tower produces radio waves, right? The stronger the gravity you're in, so if I went and stood next to the sun as opposed to next to Earth, so I'm in a place where gravity's pulling harder on me, time moves slower for me relative to someone who's standing in a place with less gravity. I experience it the same, but relative to the other person, they're going faster. So if you're in a less gravity area, your time goes faster than a person who's in a higher gravity area. Totally crazy, but if you were to set two watches identical with a perfect atomic clock and take one next to a black hole and keep one here on Earth, for every second that the person next to the black hole saw a pass on his clock, it would feel like a second. He's counting one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. It could literally be years on the other person. Like by the time the person next to the black hole, because he's in a very high gravity field, says one, 1,000, it could be 10 years to the person standing on Earth. So pretty crazy, right? So what, the, what, what is relative in the theory of relativity is how time passes depending on where you're at in space. Okay? Another thing that's kind of crazy that Einstein figured out has to do with the speed of light. So not only does time pass variably depending on what gravity you're in, it also varies relatively depending on how fast you're moving relative to the speed of light. So everybody's heard people on TV say this so-and-so star is 500 light years away, right? Okay, a light year is how, long, or how far you would go at the speed of light in one year. So if it's 500 light years, that means at the speed of light, it would take me 500 years to get there, right? However, if you were the one moving at the speed of light to you in your personal experience, you would get there instantaneously. So the closer, the closer you get to the speed of light, here's the speed of light, and here's time, how you experience time, the closer you get to the speed of light, the less you experience time passing. This is blow your mind type stuff, but this is literally what we understand about the universe. And there's a point to me trying to get this in your head. Right. So if I were going at the speed of light, if I got on a spaceship like on Star Trek and started revving the engine going faster and faster and faster and I finally got to the speed of light, I would just teleport to wherever I was going to. But to you, my wife, standing on the earth waiting for me to get to Saturn at the speed of light, it might take a long time. She's counting on her watch because she's not moving at the speed of light. She says, it took him 500 light years to get to that star, it took him 500 years in my time, and to him it felt like I teleported. So as an application, if we drive faster, we live longer. Right. That's exactly true. So, I know this stuff sounds crazy, but it is being put to use in every single cell phone in this room. So, you guys all remember, like, all of a sudden when GPS started becoming, like, a thing that everybody had access to, and at first, if you had an old GPS and you were a hunter and you used it in the woods, it was good to, like, this room. Like, it would tell you that you're within 50 yards of... Well, like, military GPS now can get you to within less than three inches of a spot from a satellite. How GPS is so accurate, they have to correct the clocks on the satellites for the fact that they're further away from the Earth and experiencing less gravity than us. So we all learn in school gravity is a function of how close you are to an object. They're further away from the center of the Earth than us, so they're in a less gravity zone, which means their clocks actually go faster than our clocks here on the Earth. 
So your GPS satellites looking at your phone, the only reason they can keep track of your car so well is every day they have to adjust their clocks three microseconds, three millionths of a second, every day. Because their clock is clicking faster than my clock here, even though they're identical in construction, right? So that's relativity. It is in use every day. So it sounds fantastical, like how could I ever need to understand this? It's being applied in all your modern electronics today. Uh, satellites are also moving at several thousand you know, miles per hour a lot of times. That's very slow relative to the speed of light, but it's fast enough that they have to make an adjustment for how much uh, slower their clocks are clicking because of their speed as well. So all of this is to say we're about to wade into a minefield of young earth and new earth, and I'm going to avoid all of it because most of the arguments in my view are just getting in the way of you experiencing God. We're not going to talk about any absolutes tonight. In fact, we're just going to cast doubts on Darwinian evolutionary theory. So we're going to talk a lot about years and when things happened. And you have the whole creation story in Genesis 1, right, where they talk about days. And my argument is that's a lot of distraction for something that's totally relative. How I experience time here on Earth versus if we were to get on a spaceship and go to Jupiter it would be different versus who knows how God experiences time. We learned last week that God transcends time and space, right? Second Peter 3 tells us that a thousand years is a day to God and a day is a thousand years, right? So the analogy I really love from C.S. Lewis is God is omnipresent and can spend as much time or as little time in any moment as he wants. He is like an author reading a book, right? So you might be reading a book, and in the book it says, Will jumps, which we all know is a momentary action. But God, as the author reading that book, could sit there and stare at those words for 10,000 years as he wants. He could be present in that moment that I'm jumping for as long as he wants, right? So to me, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about, about when different species came into existence and um, a lot of the young earth, new, uh, old earth stuff is, is really people who are just not familiar with what we know about space and time at this point, right? Who's, who's year? Who's 100,000 years, right? If I go fast enough to the speed of light, 100,000 years could be less than a half a second to you, right? Or if I go stand next to a black hole, I can make a million years pass in a second, right? We can both experience time entirely differently. So it gets a little arbitrary to me at that point. So is that fun, everybody? You can learn more about Einstein now, right? So general relativity. Time is totally relative to your position in space and gravity and how fast you're going relative to the speed of light. Also, energy and mass are the same thing. Don't forget that. So you learned some engineering lessons today. So all right, with that. Let's go into evolution. First, we got to do some definitional things, right? You hear a lot of people, and me, last week, Mike corrected me several times if you caught him. We, everybody just says evolution. Do you believe in evolution? You know, evolution, evolution, right? That is not a specific en enough term, right? Evolution... If somebody comes to you and says, you know, do you believe in evolution, you have to say, what do you mean by that, right? Because what they mean is neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory, which is what we're going to cover next, right? So evolution is basically just stuff changes. And I don't think we really refute that. Stuff has changed, meaning it was different before and it's different now and it's probably going to be different later, but that's not really what we're combating, right? So evolution is not what we're, we're dealing with. What we're dealing with used to be called Darwinism and then it became Darwinian evolutionary theory. All right, so Darwin, 
let's first let's understand what Darwinism is. So, so Darwin came and wrote his book in 1859. It's titled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. There's also a subtitle about preserving the superior races or something like that. Um, they, nobody ever talks about that. Um, so, so Darwin's, Darwin's theory, he was not the first to, to notice some of his observations, but he was the first to add in what we all know as natural selection, which is a, the mechanism by which changes get locked in place, right? So um, Darwin observed several key facts. So I'm bad. I, I don't plan out very well how to write on the board, so I'm sorry. I wish... Next class, when you guys all come back to learn all this again, I'll make a whole bunch of PowerPoints, which will be easier. Um, so we're starting with Darwinism. And he had some observations. And then he had some inferences. Okay, so inferences, fancy word for guesses. It's good to know which ones are which, right? So if you really want to understand Darwin, we'll boil it down into a few things, right? Is that resources are limited. Populations do not grow exponentially. Individuals vary and traits are heritable. We'll call those facts. I don't argue with many of those, or any of them, right? His inferences, which is really what we mean when we talk about his theory, is that Limited resources lead to a struggle for life. Reproduction happens most by those best suited for life. And that unequal ability to reproduce will lead to gradual permanent change in that population. We all kind of know that, right? That's, when we say natural selection, that's what we mean by natural selection, is that not everybody survives. The people who are best suited to live and reproduce the most in their environment do reproduce the most. And because of that, the traits that made them best suited to live uh, become permanent. None of that is all that crazy. In fact, there's not much evidence to say that that's not true in local population groups. So what we're not going to fight today is what we call um, local Darwinian evolution. Do the polar bears with the thickest fur live better than the ones with the thinner fur? Sure. And does that mean over time polar bears develop thick fur relative to their grizzly bear cousins, which are further south? Sure, right? Uh, do certain finch beaks get thicker when they live in regions that require thick beaks to break open Brazil nuts? Sure, right? But the leap that has been made is that that mechanism alone, the ability to reproduce more because of preferable traits and very gradually over time causing you to change a population, 
is capable of, one, large differences in animal groups, what we would recognize as species. So a sheep versus a whale, or a sheep versus a crocodile, right? Or that it has anything to do with creation at all, okay? So I don't know how people got creation. I think we can throw out creation. I'll save us an hour. Let's throw out creation right off the bat. What did we learn last week about syllogisms? You gotta analyze the propositions, right? What are, what, what are Darwin's propositions? That in order to evolve, you have to reproduce. Well, what's fundamental to reproducing? Existence. Being alive and existing. So I, I don't know how reproducing is proposed as a cause for existing, because you kind of got to exist and be alive to reproduce, right? So you have to have a self-replicating system, um, which there's no explanation here for how you get from inanimate particles to self-replicating beings. You have to grant the first cell. Yeah, yes, right? You, in fact, you have to grant them more than the first cell. So anyway, we'll get into more of that, right? So, all right, enter... Everybody good with this? I didn't write the last ones, but you guys, these are inferences. This, the, the natural selection part is his big inference. I should have just wrote natural selection down here, right? Everybody good with that? So that was 1859. Seems like a really good plan. It, it actually, it's a pretty incredible guess given the time frame. Because what you got to understand is nobody even knew that cells existed like, it was right around the same era that, that a guy was discovering the cell and kind of thought the cell existed, but nobody knew what the inside of the cell looked like. Nobody knew that DNA existed. Like, he, he was there. That's way back in time relative to science. So, 1953, you get Watson and Crick. Everybody remember them from high school? No, from that video I do. Double helix. They figured out the structure of DNA. Okay, that's what they're famous for, is figuring out the helical structure of DNA. In my, in my contestation, it is not actually the most important that they, thing that they discovered. So Crick actually was a code breaker in World War II. And he was the first one to kind of understand and then subsequently discover that the power in DNA was in the fact that it was a code. It was a language, right? So. We'll get into DNA in a second. Well, we'll do it now. Um, so DNA, everybody has heard of the word DNA before. It's in every single cell in your body. It's all the information that your body needs to make your body and function. Uh, you get half of it from your mom, half of it from your dad, and that's the only time that you ever get information in your life. So you get half the information from the egg and half the information from the sperm, and in that one meeting, full set of chromosomes, you have all of the information required to make all the things that we're going to look at on the TV, right? Um, DNA is just really long, looks like a ladder that's twisted, and in the, the, the legs of the ladder, the steps of the ladder are chemicals. There's only four of them. It's A, T, C, and G. The ladder is about 3 billion steps long in a human. It's a little over 3 billion steps long. There's 3 billion legs, or steps. You read DNA, what was discovery of Crick, is that DNA is read like a book for directions on how to do things, primarily to construct proteins. So we all know you know, eat your proteins, you need proteins, right? Proteins are the most fundamental and important thing in your body for making it function. Proteins are made of amino acids. We've all heard of the word amino acids before, right? If you lift it all, you take base compound amino acids, right? So amino acids are what make up proteins. Proteins are essentially just long chains of beads like a necklace. And each bead is an amino acid. Turns out there's only 20 amino acids, right? So at each position in the necklace for every bead, you have a choice between 20 different colors. And how you line up the different colors in a different necklace of a different length will cause it 
to change shape and bend into a shape. And a protein shape is what provides its function in your body. And we're gonna watch a video in a second that'll blow your mind on how proteins really work, right? So all DNA does is in little increments as a code, so there's only four possible letters, I just made that up. And what your body knows to do is to look at this block of three and this block of three and this block of three and say, oh, I'm supposed to use the ruby bead first, the opal bead second, the diamond bead next. So there are actually other proteins that go down your DNA strand, read the code, and build another protein. And so they'll pick the color of the bead in the necklace based on the directions from the DNA, and they'll build a 20 bead necklace, and it will fold up because of the, the colors they picked. It will make a specific fold, and it will become useful to your cell for different things, okay? So that's what, that's what Watson and Crick finally figured out a little bit later than this. This is when they figured out the helical shape. Could you um, uh, elaborate on the cell? The all cells aren't the same, are they? I mean, if that's doing that, it's not creating a bunch of the same cell because don't I need a different cell to make the, a lung and a heart? This is happening inside every single cell. So we haven't even gotten to different cells yet. So inside every single cell that you have in your body, whether it's a skin cell, liver cell, lung cell, brain cell, every they're not the same. Right? They're not the same, but every single cell inside of it has a complete copy of your entire genetic code. So it has the so if I were to pull out a cell from my brain, it has all the code, including my toe cells. Uh-huh. That's why when you start out, you hear the word stem cell. Those are cells very early on in development. In fact, um, adults still make stem cells to repair other organs. So the most fundamental cell is a stem cell, and it hasn't decided what type of cell to become yet. So to become a different type of cell, like if I wanted to be, go from a stem cell when I was you know, an embryo in my mom's womb, right? Before that stem cell decided it wanted to start being a liver cell, different parts of its DNA had to be turned off and on. We want to turn off all the parts of the DNA that tell you how to be a lung cell and a brain cell and a toe cell and a toenail cell and an eye cell and just turn on the parts that tell you how to be a liver cell. So it just turns on the parts of the code that make proteins that make it a liver cell. And all the functions that your liver do are based on the proteins that its cells have because the proteins are what do jobs, right? Uh, we're going to watch a really awesome video. What is the, where do the instructions come for that I don't have a liver in my brain? And how is it laid out like that? We don't know. <laughs> I was going to ask. We're jumping way ahead to the end of the thing. Stem cell hasn't decided what it wants to be. Yeah. I was going to say, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that it wasn't instructed? What it <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, we'll get there. This is good. But you guys are getting it already. We're jumping ahead, right? Um, so the reason I bring this up is because DNA it wasn't known yet when Darwin first made his theory. So I'm going to answer these questions. I love it, right? Uh, this is what we're getting to. But just so you know the history, because we want to be specific with our language, all the secular people got really excited about the DNA because um, we now had a way to provide a mechanism for random mutation. Okay, so if, if you've ever heard the word random mutation, right? So... We started with Darwinian theory, right? Darwinian evolution or Darwinism in the 1800s. We finally started figuring out the DNA cell and that's what led us to Neo-Darwinian. Yes, it's coming next. So this When people say colloquially, do you believe in evolution? This is actually probably what they mean. Neo, anytime you hear the word neo, it just means new, right? Neo-conservative or neo-Nazi or neo-whatever is just a fancy way for saying new. New Darwinian theory. We added something new to Darwin's theory, and that is the idea 
of DNA. So you start out with a single cell. Sperm meets egg. You have one copy of all the genetic code. Well, in order to start dividing and have all your stem cells turn into other types of cells, we got to make copies of our DNA, right? Because we need every single cell to have a copy of all the blueprint instructions on how to work and how to make proteins, right? So that's why DNA has its double helix. It's like a ladder, okay? So we said it's like a ladder that's twisted. Well, you can split that ladder in half with a big chainsaw, and you get two halves, and based on the two halves, you can build the second half, right? Because there's only one set of base pairs in the middle, so if, as long as I know what half of the ladder is, like the step, as long as I know what, what the one side of the step was, I can build the other side and make an identical ladder. So that's how cells divide and that they all have a copy of the DNA. As your DNA is copied all the time. It's been copied probably a trillion times since I started talking tonight, right? Every time your skin schleffs off and you make new skin cells underneath, they're getting a whole new copy of your DNA, right? So lots of copying going on. Well, errors are made when you copy, right? So every now and then, during the copying process, at random places in the code, an A will get thrown out, and instead they'll accidentally put a C where an A should have been, right? That's a random mutation, yeah. Doesn't your body naturally correct it, seeing it as a mistake, and try to destroy it, or doesn't it one way or another? It does. In fact, most of the time, it's killing and throwing away mutation errors all the time, because most of the time they're not good. Cancer is a result of uh, genetic mutation, right? Um, a couple of the alleles get screwed up and then they never turn off the repl replication function and then you get a tumor, right? The problem is, and why it fits so well with Darwin's original theory, is what matters is what's the copy of the gene or the DNA that goes into the sperm or egg cell that becomes the next person, because then they can't throw it away. Right? Fundamentally, when you go to make your egg cell as a woman or your sperm cell as a man, to make that sperm cell, you've got to copy your DNA so that that sperm has half your DNA. And if you make an error into that sperm cell and it becomes a kid, it's got no choice. can't throw that away. Like That's all the DNA code it has. It's now going to replicate that in all of its cells, and that error, that mutation, is going to be part of its new code. It's in there forever. It's in all of its cells. And that's how you get variation, right? That's how things look different. That's how some, some people are taller and shorter and have brown hair and green hair. That's why. It's because there's slightly different variations in their DNA. Huh? You say we're just waiting to see the green hair. Oh. Green, green eyes. <laughs> green eyes, brown hair. I dye my hair a lot. You know, it's green normally. Um, so that's random mutation. And the reason this got tied into Darwin so well is like, oh, that's how traits are heritable. So remember, Darwin's observation is that individuals vary, and a lot of their traits are heritable by their kids. And it gave an explanation for why things vary, because we have this random mutation function that every now and then there's a little bit of randomness thrown into the blueprint of your code that could make you different. And that now gives an engine with natural selection to make things change, okay? Um, all right, so we all have a good understanding, right, of that. Another thing you'll hear this called is the modern synthesis, because it's synthesizing a lot of the genetic science that's been discovered since Darwin and Darwinian biology. Um, so, just so you know, there's been disagreements with this idea since the very beginning. Not small ones and not just in religious communities. So in 1966, so remember, Watson and Crick was in 1953. It was in the late 50s that they started realizing that DNA was used as a code. It's a big, long word that gives directions, right? In 1966, after they're kind of realizing how long the genome is and how much it is, there's actually a big conference pulled together at a place called the Worcester Institute, and the conference was titled Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinian Interpretation of Evolution. Right off the bat, a bunch of not Christian, not religious uh, academics, mostly mathematicians, said that 
this doesn't make sense. Like, it doesn't make sense mathematically for reasons we're going to talk about next. And most importantly, it doesn't make sense because of what we understand about any known language. So, if you think about, very important, that string of characters I wrote out, A, T, G, C, C, it has a meaning, okay? So, certain characters turn into certain things, and one of the guys who was the leader of that conference in 1966 was a very famous MIT mathematician named Murray Eden. He said, no existing formal language can tolerate random changes in the symbol sequences which express its sentences. Meaning is almost invariably destroyed. So the mathematician's argument from the very beginning is that if I start throwing in random changes to a sentence, I am almost invariably destroying meaning and not adding any new meaning. And we know this intuitively to be true. If I were to write a sentence of Shakespeare on the board and allow a math program to start randomly changing individual letters one at a time randomly, it could, you know, it would be random which letter it changed and be random what it changed to, we would sit here for a very long time before any of us expected a new meaningful word to show up, let alone rearrange into a new meaningful sentence, right? So that was their challenge right off the bat. And no one's even heard of this conference. It was over 300 people, it was a, it was a big deal. In fact, the proceedings from it are still pretty famous. Um, but you all assume that Darwinian evolution has never been challenged by the scientific community ever. Right? The fact is it's been challenged ever since the beginning, and uh, the more and more we learn about the evidence, the more and more it's untenable to believe today, which is what we're going to get into next. So um, with that, let's go into the problems of Darwinian evolution, neo-Darwinian evolution. Yeah, neo is an incorporation of DNA. <laughs> Uh, holy smokes, 15 minutes left. Let's get on with this real quick. So, here are your four big categories. Fossil record. Mathematical problem. of information. Irre irreducible. I might spell these terribly wrong. I'm not a very good speller. Irreducible complexity. And lastly, my own argument. So real quick, because uh, I don't want to hold you guys over, but we're finally at the payoff. So fossil record. <clears throat> sure, sure, bro. Uh, so fossil record. So what we know about what we know about Darwin's theory is that yeah, is that if it were true, changes between organisms and structures would take a, an extremely long time by natural selection, right? So we've all seen, uh, we've all seen kind of like the Darwinian tree of how, species came from one another, right? You start up here, you had like a really old crocodile, and then you had the North American crocodile and the Nile crocodile. And you guys have seen these types of trees and stuff before, right? Um, what is lost on you is how long these Ys would actually have to take over. And 
this is their this is their own theory, right? This is Darwinian evolution to get splits between an animal group or a species take hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Because if you think about it, you have your dog, or well, let's pick uh, let's pick like an elk and a deer. They look they're pretty similar, right? Like, so you start originally with whatever ancestor. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and for a very long time, like hundreds of millions of years, they would still be indistinguishable. There would be no such thing as an elk or a deer. There'd be some deer at school that are a little bit bigger than the other deer and some that are a little bit more brown and there are some that are a little bit more gold and then some that start growing bigger horns. And like for a very, 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 very long time, they would all just look like deer and would very, very, very slowly accumulate differences is the hypothetical, right? So what you expect from the fossil record is extremely slow divergence between animal forms and you expect continuous change. So by that I mean Darwinian evolution has no ability to explain a large lateral move, right? I can't go from being a deer to within like a couple thousand years or even a couple hundred thousand years or even a couple million years to being a sheep, right? I gotta look something like a deer for a really, really, really long time because we're diverging very, very slowly, right? Um, this is the exact opposite of what the fossil record shows. And you never heard much about it growing up because the assumption was that you just needed more time to find the missing fossils. Well, let's not make a big deal out of it. We'll just keep looking and eventually we'll find all the missing fossils. And the joke now is that you go to the muse museum and you see the, the ancient elephant turning into the ancient hippo, turning into the ancient whale, which is the story, right? And there's arrows in between. And the joke now is, where'd they dig up the arrows, right? Because the this is literally true. The more and more fossil finds they, they come across, the more and more the fossil record actually refutes the ideas of evolutionary theory. Yeah? Wouldn't they say that it's partially because uh, for a fossil, the conditions have to be so extremely bright that you're just inevitably going to get snapshots over time? That has been their argument for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> except that only seems to be an argument around one very specific period, which we're going to talk about right now, which is called the Cambrian Explosion. So. About 540 million years ago, give or take, don't get mad at me about young earth or new earth stuff. Just take it what it is. I don't know. Could have been 540 milliseconds ago in somebody else's experience. Uh, there's an insane explosion in the number of animals and body forms that are found on the earth. And by that I mean pre-540 million years ago, about all they have fossils for, and they have a significant number of them. It's not like before this they have no fossils. Uh, it's mostly single-celled organisms and organisms that only have one cell type. So we just spent a lot of time talking about how we have a bunch of different cell types in our body, right? Pre this time, all you had was stuff that was either single cell or predominantly one cellular type. No or organs or major differentiation of cell types, right? Within a very small window, 70 million years, you have the emergence of some 20 distinct, still existing today, body plans, what we'll refer to as body plans. And so if you go to a biology book, right, uh, and, and you look up the different levels of, you know, we know species, family, uh, phylum, kingdom, dominion, right, as you go up, 
Body plans are like, do I have a skeleton or an exoskeleton, right? Do I have legs or am I a segmented worm, right? Like those are your body plans. None of them existed pre, pri, or prior. All of them that we know today existed very rapidly all at once. Um, so 70 million years sounds like a really long time, but it's actually a very short amount of time. And oh, by the way, about 10 years ago, this got dropped down to, actually it was only about a 20 million year period. Oh, oh, in 2013 actually, in China, the most recent find was that this is now down to six million years. So at first, people were saying, oh, well, this is a long time. Like there could have been, a, they were looking for theories that, oh, well, that's when oxygen became prevalent on the earth and that allowed evolution to speed up. Well, that theory fell apart. And well, this is actually a long time. Or, oh, we're actually gonna find these fossils going backwards and existing here. Uh, and you'll find continuity eventually. That has yet to happen. Um, and actually, as they find more and more digs, the, the amount of time over which this explosion of species and body forms exists continues to shrink. The other piece of evidence... Is five million years a long time? But it's, a, we measure this? it's an extremely small amount of time. So, I, I was, yeah, so not only is that a very small time geologically, so the other piece of evidence that, that they keep hoping to find fossils to refute is that there's not a whole lot of tremendous body change within these. There's significant change within each of these body plans, but you have the first exoskeleton, you know, crab-like, bug-like things here, and you have exoskeleton, crab, and bub-like things that we have today. Now, there's been significant changes, right? They didn't necessarily have the scorpion that we did back then, but they had exoskeleton-legged, bug-like creatures like a crab, right? They had things that had vertebrates. They had things that had spines and organs then. And yeah, there's different types of vertebrates back then than we have today. Like, they don't have any fossils of chimpanzees or humanoids back then or elephants. But they had things that had that same type of body plan, right? And in between are the dinosaurs, which are also vertebrates with bones and organs. So there hasn't been the type of dramatic body plan change in any of these vertical columns since then that they would expect or hope to find. And they keep hoping to find it, and they keep just finding more and more evidence that fits into these columns. So why is this not a very long time? Well, it's just not a very long time relative to the amount of time life has been around. So life has been around about three billion years, right? So three billion is 3,000 million years. So if you think about six million relative to 3,000, so six relative to 300, it's like, uh, is it 2%? And 2% of the amount of time, no, it's less than that, right? Million, thousand? It's 0.2%. 0.2%. Yeah, yes? Anyway, it's very small amount of the time that, that life has existed, that we have fossils to show that life has existed, where almost all of the biodiversity shows up all at once. And since then, every time we see a new major body plan that pops up, there's been 16 of these other, what they call smaller explosions. So this is called the Cambrian explosion. I forgot to write that. I'm stressed because I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. This is the Cambrian explosion. And since then, there's been several places where they find new major body types that weren't part of the Cambrian that all of a sudden show up. But that's exactly the point. They all of a sudden show up. There's no connecting fossil record that shows a new body type showing up from this. What actually happens is at a later date in geological time, which means at a different layer in the rock, all of a sudden four more new body plants show up that in no way seem to come from the ones previously. So the fossil record, I'm not saying there's enough to make conclusions of, but it in no way matches what you would expect from neo-Darwinian theory. 
just, I, 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 just to clarify, for us not as smart as you people, as him, <laughs> is if it were Darwinian, shouldn't it look like it all comes from one source? Yeah, like and they would all? actually, they would take way long to split. There would be very slow divergence between body types, right? Because uh, if I were going to grow a fifth arm, it's not like all of a sudden my kid would have a fifth arm and then there would be a whole population of people that had fifth arms and then they would be mating by themselves as the five arm people and we'd be mating by ourselves as the four arm people, right? It'd be, it'd be a very, very slow thing over millions and millions of years, which is not what you see. So, mathematical problems. This is a slow amount of time too because now we understand how common mutations are, how frequently they happen amongst the population group, and things that we call population genetics. So there's a whole field of mathematics, mathematical biology now, called population genetics. And this is where, if you know estimates of a population size and how often mutations happen and how many mutations need to happen to get a new protein, you can actually come up with a reasonable estimate of the amount of time it would take for a particular um, feature to show up or how much change you could expect amongst a body type over 100 million years or 200 million years. For the amount of change or difference you see in body types from pre-Cambrian to post-Cambrian, the most liberal mathematical approximations say you need something like 500 million years, right? So you need half a billion years to get the amount of divergence of body type that you see in the Cambrian and what even in the most earliest conservative numbers was like 70, 100 million year time period, which has now been squashed to about six. So it's just not enough time biologically. Because if you imagine, we talked about those random mutations, the only random mutation that gets carried on is the one that's in your sperm or your egg cell. So that means the only roll of the dice you get for, uh, the only role of the dice you get for making a new trait and carrying it on to the next generation is having a baby. And there's only so many babies that happen in a population group, so you have to have so many generations happen before we have enough rolls of the dice to expect to see enough mutations. How many mutations will we expect to be positive versus negative in a regular time period? That's good. Uh, none. <laughs> That's third, third. Oh, sorry. That's third. So. No. So the other big mathematical problem is that early on, we didn't know so these numbers are hard to even conceive. They're kind of like the fine-tuning of the universe. But we didn't know how many amino acids there were and how long generally proteins were. So if you imagine, if I have that necklace with 20 different colors, each bead I make the necklace longer is another option of 20 that I could make the necklace different, right? So if I have a necklace that's 10 beads long, it's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20. So it's 20 to the 10th power options for the colors I could make that necklace. So your average protein is around 200 beads long, and there's 20 amino acids. It turns out that like, the average space, the average amount of possibilities of ways you could put amino acids together to make proteins is a very large number. And what we didn't know until the last 10 years when a whole group of scientists in America started looking at this stuff is, well, how many of those combinations actually fold up into usable proteins. Remember, the goal of proteins is to fold them into a particular shape so that they do something, like you fold them into a hammer so your cell has a hammer to do stuff with, right? It's a big number too, but it's way smaller than this number. And so the way these numbers work is you have to subtract these two. So if you think about it, by subtracting them, so 77 minus 30. So what's that first number represent? The, the second number is, is sorry. Just review again because I'm, I'm missing it. We'll just say this. One out of every 10 to the 37th possibilities of ways you could put a protein together is actually functional. So if I, if I had a haystack 
If I had a, a haystack the size of the entire North America, right, of proteins that were all unique, like a snowflake. They were all necklaces, but they were all one bead different, at least. Only one out of 10 to the 37th would be functional. So now, let's think about, I write a sentence on the board, like last time. That's my functional protein. If I just start allowing Darwin random mutation to change any one of these numbers randomly, one at a time, I gotta change it that many times to be guaranteed to get another sentence that makes any sense in a, pro in a protein language world, right? Of course, it could happen on the first try, but 10 to the 37th is like, it's, it's, it's an insanely large number. For reference, the reason this is so unbelievable is that they only estimate there to have been 10 to the 40th organisms in the history of the universe. So if you look at Earth, life's been around like 3 billion years. If I look at every single single-celled organism, every single animal that's ever lived ever, they only think it's about 10 to the 40th. So you've only had time to roll the dice 10 to the 40th times you would have only found one or two other functional proteins, which is one or two additional functional proteins is not enough to make different animals. It's like not even enough to make a new cell type. There's way more different proteins between a liver cell and an eye cell than just a handful, and yet look at the biodiversity on the world. So the mathematical problem has really spun out of the computer science world, but the numbers just don't make sense on random genetic mutation for it to work. It is just impossible for it to happen. Um, so the next thing, I'm gonna play a quick video and we're gonna look at irreducible complex, uh, complexity real quick, which I hope will blow your mind as well. And then the last one is my own, which I think is the best, because I made it. All right, so let's see. Now I'm going to show you the folding problem and what we're looking to try to do. This is a protein that's all stretched out. You see four red col uh, colored amino acids here. And the basic idea is this is a chain that needs to find its shape. And we know that these four red beads, we know after the fact that these four red beads need to find each other. It's very much like you walking through a crowd of people trying to find your close friends. It's a fairly random process, but sooner or later you can sometimes do it. Those red beads need to find each other. This is called folding. And if you look at the blue strands, what they need to do is they need to line up like train tracks. And what the gold part needs to do is coil up like a helix. And this is showing you the folding process. And what you, one thing you'll notice is that these pieces form and they do it systematically. The other thing you will notice, so this is the final shape and this is the shape that your protein has when it's in your body. This is the shape it needs to function. But the other thing you notice about this movie is it's very jiggly. Why is that? It's because protein molecules are so small that they get banged around by water molecules. Think about riding a bicycle in a windstorm. You're trying to get somewhere, but you keep getting blown around. And that's how protein molecules have to function too. They have to deal with these little microscopic windstorms. So this is the shape of a folded protein. The folding problem and the folding code is the business about if I knew what the sequence of amino acids is, how do I figure out what the structure is? Now this next picture is showing you a more realistic, bigger protein molecule. Most pro protein molecules are bigger than the one I just showed you. They often look something like this. And now I want to switch from talking about the folding problem per se to talking about mechanisms and functions. And the case I want to make for you is that proteins are machines. You have 20,000 odd different types of machines in your body and then other kinds of living organisms have other kinds of protein machines. There's tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of different machines. And the first case I want to make for you is that these are real machines. That's not a metaphor. They use energy, they spin around, they pump, they act to cause force and motion. 
This is just a side view, a static view of a thing that is a protein motor. That light gray at the top is your cell membrane. Above it is the outside of the cell, below it is the inside of the cell. And this is just showing you a static picture, and now what I'm going to do is to show you a dynamical movie of how this machine actually works. This is a picture of that, this is a movie of that machine, and what you can see is it pumps acids, those are the little cubicle things, in and out of your cell so that it keeps the pH balance in your cell. And the things down at the bottom, the little cards going in and out, that's where the energy comes and goes. And what you can see is a ribbon diagram. So that shows you the nature of the protein molecule. And a critical point that I want to make about that movie and about how proteins function in general is they function by shape and by shape changes. And you could see that protein molecule going back and forth as different chemicals come and go. Shape is the critical thing here. Next, I want to show you another type of rotary motor. It's one that does not pump acids in and out of cells, but rather it actually creates force. If you're a bacterial cell, you need to propel yourself around in water to find food. What you need is something like the propeller on the back of a boat. But life doesn't have propellers for various reasons. Instead, what it does is it have, has long tails called flagella. And so now I'm going to show you a movie of a rotary motor that runs the tails on bacteria. Here you see it. Those are the tails. Now you're zooming in, and you're going to see the rotary motor in a ki kind of a cartoony-like fashion. This, too, is a real protein, and it uses energy, and it creates motion. That's rotary proteins. Those are a couple of many rotary proteins. Now I'm going to show you Another kind of protein, this is a motor that slides back and forth. Well, none of you probably realized before. I didn't until recently. Uh, is that inside your cell, you have thousands of complex machines that literally work just like the machines we build in our real lives. They are just as complex and have just as many parts. This is a motor that consists of, I think, 39 parts, so 39 different proteins, so all the different colors and shapes you see assembled here are all different proteins that then have to be assembled into the motor to function the way it does. It has a bushing that doesn't spin and holds onto the cell. It has a stator and a rotor. It has a thing that you put gasoline in, ATP, to, to make it move chemically. It is an engine. And what a guy by the name of Michael Behe finally realized, as he's a biological chemist, he's studying these cells, or these uh, uh, micro-machines in the cell, of which there are tens of thousands of types. This is how your cell does all the things it does. Copies DNA, transport water in and out, pulls salt in and out, does all the bodily functions. How your muscles contract is with little motors that walk along the muscle fibers. Um, what he started realizing is that you can't really take away any singular part of any of these machines and have them be functional or usable. And that puzzled him when he started thinking about neo-Darwinian theory, because he, he believed in Darwinian evolution. And for a long time, he just thought, huh, I wonder how these evolved. And the more he chewed on it, the more he realized there Neo-Darwinian mechanism, the natural selection, is insufficient to create an integrated complex machine like this. Because you wouldn't get all the proteins all at once. What you're hypothetically saying is that on accident, through random mutation, you would accidentally make one of these proteins. And for some reason, that would be beneficial enough for all your offspring to carry that for millions of years, for you to then accidentally make another part of that motor. And then a couple million years later, accidentally make another part. Oh, and by the way, how do they ever get assembled accidentally into that structure? And he coined the term what he called irreducible complexity. Integrated systems that are designed, the more integrated they are, the more sensitive they are to what they call perturbations or disturbances. Mousetrap is a really easy example. A mousetrap cannot function without any of its parts. 
It is reliant on 100% of its parts for it to do the function that it does. As soon as you remove a part, it is no longer a mousetrap, right? It has no value until it is completely assembled in the form in which it's assembled with all of its parts intact. And there is no slow, gradual, natural selection mechanism that's going to lead you to the form of complexity of micromachines we see in the cell. Um, there's been no evidence to refute this. Um, in fact, Behe's new book is actually titled Darwin Devolves, and he is still a microbiologist, a, a, a biological chemist, and his experimentation in his lab has proven that actually most of the simpler structures you see in a cell are from random changes to the code that makes these things and them devolving into simpler, less functional things. That the more complex things existed first and they found fossil evidence for this, right? So there's some simpler mechanisms in the cell, uh, parts of this particular machine that exist as a syringe in another part of the cell for moving fluids in and out. And originally people proposed that as, well, here's proof that a smaller portion of that machine existed that could have been assembled into this. And they have found now through uh, genetic experimentation that the, the rotor actually existed many millions of years before the syringe. This, the motor likely devolved into the syringe. And his new book, which is um, less part of the lexicon because this was very famous and led to a bunch of court cases and stuff, um, his new book is called Darwin Devolves, that random genetic mutation as Mike already pointed out earlier, and as we intuitively know from looking at the sentence, that if you have something that's meaningful and you make random changes to it, it almost inevitably destroys the meaning or the function of the cell. It almost never adds function, which is the, the proposed mechanism by which it works. So um, there's a lot of these. In fact, I can send you more videos like Stephen Myers. Want to jump in? No, you're yeah, you're good. And then... Um, so, going back to last week's illustration I give, I get to just repeat myself. Um, so, historically, what happened was Behe writes this book, um, Darwin's Black Box, and explains irreducible complexity. And here's the logic, and it's beautiful. He says, you think that evolution is on a big scale. Like, people just generally think that. You have a monkey, you see the picture of the monkey, and then he gets to be a bigger monkey, he's a gorilla, then he's a Neanderthal, then he's a man, right? And you think big. His point was, and, and he says in his book, which I read, and a regular person gets about halfway through and glazes over, but the first half's really good. Um, his point is this, if there is, that, that's the theory of evolution as it begins. It's at that level of this big animal. He says there's zero, there's not a single person who's ever come up with a theory of evolution at the microbiological machine level. And then he makes this point, if there's no theory of evolution at the micro level, there is no theory of evolution that's working. And that's what rocked the world because he was an insider. He's not a, I still don't know today if he's a Christian or a deist or whatever he is, but that is what caused Stephen Hawking, the guy over in the wheelchair. I say that because people mix him up with Dawkins because their name is so, Dawkins is the arrogant, really not that bright American scientist. Hawking's is the brilliant, smarter than the rest of his guy in the wheelchair. Um, that's a way to think of it. Um, one of them's a huckster selling books, thinking he's a smart atheist. The other guy is really, really smart. And, but his answer to Behe in the public criticism and what he says makes a lot of difference in the scientific world was you're not supposed to come out and say there is no theory of evolution at the microbiological level, you're supposed to come up with it. Now what that indicates is he starts with the presupposition, which is where Will started us last week, that, that this had to happen by accident. And why does he believe that? We don't know. It's just his faith. He believes God didn't do it. Therefore, he says, be he, be a loyal priest of science and come up with the doggone theory. That's your job, which is a leap of faith. Anyway, back to you, boss. No, that's perfect. Um, yeah, so in 2016, there's another conference in Europe at the Royal Society, one of the oldest uh, 
college based societies around. Again, hundreds and hundreds of people came. And the whole point was evolutionary biology is in crisis and we need to come up with a new theory. And you never heard about it in the news anyway. Uh, some of the main speakers there, uh, their, points, their point was, that uh, one of the guy's quotes was that uh, deconstructing Darwinism is so mid-1990s. Like, the people who are in the know are over casting stones at Darwin. They know it doesn't work. There are people actively working on trying to come up with new ways to explain it outside of God, because no one at that conference is actually proposing God outside of a small constituent of uh, intelligent design advocates. So last one, we're way over, but give me, give me 13 more minutes, guys. Uh, uh, by the way, when, when he was going this, I said, don't put an ending time on the class. I was afraid people wouldn't show up, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's a three hour. Okay. What does that mean? What, is, what does this sentence mean? That's what that means. Okay. <laughs> it means the fire burned. Why do you guys don't see that? This is this is the scribbles that mean burning stuff and and. This is the scribble that means fire. And in my new language, the descriptor lags the noun, right? What, why does this mean what we all agree it means? Because we agree that it means that. That is exactly why, right? So. Why does that not mean something? Because nobody decided that it does. If somebody came along, an intelligent being, and attributed meaning to that, it would mean something. Right? That's why we can't understand Chinese. But they do. Right? The ideas are the same. A dog is a dog. Right? We, on this side of the world, have decided that this otherwise arbitrary scratches and symbols means the dog ran. And on a different side of the world, it's a different arbitrary collection of symbols and scratches that means the same thing, right? Is the meaning of this at all tied to the material that make it up? This plastic, this pen? It's not, right? I could scratch that with a knife on a tree, and you would still know the meaning, right? I could write it in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of different mediums and materials. Nothing about the material is integral to the meaning. Just the code is, the arbitrary arrangement. And it's only not arbitrary because we've decided it's not arbitrary, okay? So where does that meaning come from? intelligence. Language is an artifact we only know exists in living, intelligent beings. And the more intelligent the being, the more complex the language. The reason logos in the Bible is the word, and the word is associated with reasoning, is because language is the fundamental way that we understand ideas. They're so linked together that you almost don't even realize that you can kind of tease them apart. We know there is a thing called a dog. And when we say the thing dog, we all have an image in our head. The idea of dog exists outside of that scribble on the board. And the reason I know that is because in other parts of the world, there's a different scribble that gives the same image of the same idea in somebody else's brain, right? So language is how we pull ideas out and make them understandable and tangible and communicable, right? So language is an artifact of intelligence. Everybody, we're good with that. That is what makes us special, by the way, is language. So 
The fundamental understanding of genetics, right, is that DNA is a code that tells the cell what amino acids to put in what order to make functional proteins. Where does that meaning come from? Why does AAT in this part of the DNA translate to put the blue amino acid next, put the blue bead next? Who said? Where's this fundamental connection? This is a translator. This is translating Chinese to English. This is, I got DNA code that the protein, which pre-exists somehow, even though the DNA has to give the direction on how to make the protein, so it's a chicken or the egg conundrum, but let's ignore that for now. There's a protein that's reading this DNA and knows based on who knows what, according to secular society, that AAT means put the blue amino acid on next. And then it reads this GCT and says, oh, put the green bead on the necklace next. Where does that meaning come from? It's a question that is 100% avoided by biology. You don't need to remember any of this other crap. It all supports this. The fundamental meaning question, which is what I'll title this, fundamental meaning. There is no proposed mechanism or solution. This is a big, long, arbitrary string of characters that unless someone imbued meaning into it would be meaningless, just as if I wrote a bunch of scribbles on the board and told you it meant the dog ran down the street, right? There's only one thing we know that produces language and imbues code, arbitrary strings of information, and makes them meaningful strings of information, and that is intelligence. We have no other examples where Meaningful information is produced where it doesn't come from an intelligent being or an intelligence. All right, so what did we learn as a definition of science at the beginning? It is the observation of uniform and repeated experience. So what does our uniform, repeated experience tell us about the creation of language or the creation of, of meaning? It only comes from intelligence, right? It is a scientific and rational explanation to look at this and say an intelligent being had to imbue this otherwise arbitrary string of four characters, three billion lines long, with fundamental meaning to tell the cell what to do. And so we go back to the original part of the class where they very astutely picked out, you said, it decided, or who told it, or nobody knows. God told it. And that's what intelligent design is coming back into the mainstream now. It's small now, but the fact that intelligent design is growing as a subset of, of biological science is, is really invigorating. Uh, because this idea of irreducible complexity points to intelligent design too. That has no function unless you design all the pieces and put all the pieces together in an assembly plan all at once. And then it goes from zero function to full function. It is like an engine in a car. An engine in a car has hundreds of parts, and if you pull one single part out, it's unlikely to function properly. Like the spark plug is this big in your huge, you know, Hemi engine. Well, if you pull a spark plug out, it's not going to function, right? So it's the same thing with that. It is designed to function the way it is, as complex as it is, with all of its parts in the right place. And the only place we see design like that is from an intelligent being. So uh, that's it for today. I'm sorry we went over. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to touch on Adam and Eve a little bit, but there is some new good scientific evidence that's, that doesn't refute the claim of Adam and Eve uh, supports it pretty well. It's not proof, um, but it's supporting evidence and certainly uh, solidifies the, the biblical story, right? So most of this stuff can be read in context to support the biblical creation story is the bottom line of the day.